Hello there, I'm Peter Shickley, and today we're going to join the Ferdare Trio, Walter Ferdare Violin, Elsa Ludwig Ferdare Clarinet, and Sylvia Roderer Piano, for a conversation with composer Libby Larson and a performance of her work, Slang, commissioned for them by Michigan State University, where they are in residence. The noted American composer Libby Larson was born on Christmas Eve, 1950, in Wilmington, Delaware, near the banks of the Brandywine River. As one of the most celebrated composers working today, Libby Larson has created works that span virtually every genre. Larson's awards and accolades are numerous, including a 1994 Grammy for her recording of The Art of Arlene Auger, featuring Larson's Sonnets from the Portuguese. Larson is a vigorous and articulate advocate for the music and musicians of our time. In 1973, together with Stephen Paulus, she founded the Minnesota Composers Forum, now the American Composers Forum, which has been an invaluable aid for composers in the United States. And she has also served on the National Endowment for the Arts music panels. Standing out as some of the major highlights in her career are her roles as composer in residence with both the Minnesota Orchestra and the Colorado Symphony. Let's join Libby Larson during a visit to Converse College in Spartanburg, South Carolina, as she and Walter Ferdare discuss her trio, Slang, and her ideas about music generally. I'd like to ask you some specific things about, about Slang, your marvelous piece that you wrote for us. Um, Let's see, when, when did you finish it? Do you remember exactly? 1989. 1989. But I think you commissioned it several, several years earlier. Oh, yes. In 86, I believe. Yes, that's right. Yes. That's so right. it took me three years to get this piece together. That, that's an interesting story by itself. Uh, let's see, we, we called and we communicated over the phone for quite a while, and then uh, you, you said you were willing to do it, and... Then you, we had a conversation a little later, right? Where, where you felt a little bit that I couldn't do it actually. App apprehensive. Yes, that's, that's I did. Interesting. I think I even offered to give you back the commissioning fee, which I, is I was stymied. Yeah. Um, and I said no, no. I know you <laughs> did, and I was so grateful to you. I'm uh, so glad. For it. I was really going through a style, well, not even a change. I was really finding the center of my my own voice as a composer. Sure. And, you know, when you're in the midst of that, uh, at least for, for me, but now in, I watch students going through, you know, either a style change or just beginning to find, yes. find the originality in themselves. Sure. Um, it's nothing that you can plan or plot. Mm. It's just a journey in, inward. Right. And uh, there comes a moment when, when you feel that you, you can't write. You know, and it takes just exactly what you did. Yeah, well, I, I'm very sympathetic because, uh, you know, sometimes things just don't want to come. Even, I mean, even with performances. Sometimes you practice and, and uh, at a certain point you can't get anything more done. So we found it's best just to quit then but, and start again the next day. You know, so uh, with composers, sometimes this has happened to us yeah. too, that uh, occasionally uh, they feel they need more time or, or they can't do it. We've had a few that just, just can't do it. Can't do it. Yes. Well, you seem to recognize that, in fact, I could do it, you know, and, and, well. um, and the result, of course, is slang, the piece yes. that, that yes. we're focusing on yes, right now. Exactly. And I have to tell you that um, uh, right about that time in the 19, late 1980s, I was making a change in publisher too, oh, yes. uh, from uh, E.C. Shermer in Boston mm -hmm. to Oxford University Press, yes. which is a different publisher. Uh, and it really was slang that was the piece that they said, we know who you are, and we want you to be with Oxford University Press oh, yes. through that piece. Isn't that great? So it's really, it's I'm quite delighted. an important piece for me. Well, I think it's, it's found a lot of um, uh, friends, you know, a lot of people want to perform it, which delights us. We've just recorded it and with the idea that it should be heard and should find the public and I'm uh, delighted. performers. Yeah, no, no, we are too. And uh, uh, at, as you were going through this style change, may, uh, do you mind just talking, uh, telling us a little bit about it? I, I can tell you about it now uh, um, because it's 10 years ago. Yeah. So I, yeah. hindsight is yeah. 
2020. Uh, it really started in, uh, in about 1984-85 when I had uh, written pieces that I was very happy with. I felt I had all the technical skill. I'd written water music, which is uh, my first symphony. It's performed a lot. And I'd written quite a number of songs and quite a bit of chamber music. <clears throat> but I was unhappy uh, because the music was coming too easily. Uh, it, it was too facile. It was too easy. It, it was not a satisfying process, yeah. just composing. Yeah. And, um, and I began to, to think about where music comes from uh, in for me in the culture. You know, and I started looking at my own record collection, which is now a CD collection. Can't yeah. say record collection yeah. anymore, right? <laughs> I began looking and realizing that I had, uh, along with my classical repertoire, my 20th century repertoire, I had a, a really extensive boogie repertoire and blues. I love Delta blues and Chicago blues. And yeah. it made me start thinking that <clears throat> perhaps um, rhythm uh, and melody really does come from language. Mm. Uh, and and yeah. and that American language is a is a rather new language, really post World War mm. II, coast yeah. to coast, um, being our first language, and I and I got to thinking very hard about what music comes out of speaking American English. Mm. It's a very rhythmic language, yeah. full of body language, very truncated, mm. uh, and a very narrow pitch band, the yeah. language that we speak. So. Um, that wasn't translating very well into string quartets, yes. you, you know, and and onto the instruments of the symphony orchestra, mm -hmm. which speak Italian and German and yeah. French, yeah. much better than they speak American English. That's uh, and so, um, so I I started to write you a piece in my old style, and these cells of rhythm started sneaking in, huh. and they didn't have anything to do with the piece that I was working yes. on. And they began to just take over more and more. So I set that piece aside and started doing some rhythmic studies, because they were much more about rhythm than pitch. Uh, and, um, uh, and gradually, I began to understand that the music that I wanted to write, and it's the music that is still coming out, mm -hmm. you know, is really much more rhythmically based. <laughs> I have to say, it occurs to me that, at least in slang, there's a lot of dialogue going on, also between the instruments. That's true, among the, the clarinet and the violin and exactly. the piano. Quite a bit of, of dialogue, yes. and um, truncated dialogue. Yeah. Just like we're, you know, one person exactly. goes, yes, exactly, yeah. and the other one goes on and takes it over. Takes it over. It and if you just analyze the rhythm of what we just said to each other, yeah. it would be quite fascinating and not 4-4. Four -four. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> no. That's right. We speak in spurts often. We do. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we punctuate with uh, body language, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wordless body language. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating to, to see what that has to do with orchestral instruments and orchestral chamber ensembles, yes. of which the Vidir is, yes. clarinet, violin, piano. That's right. The Fair Dare Trio asked me to play a little bit of Libby's piece, but I don't think they realize what an awful sight reader I am. I've never seen it before, but I'll give it a try. <laughs> I think that's about as much as I can handle. Let's hear it as it really sounds. The Fair Dare Trio, performing Libby Larson's Slang. Thank you. 
I was so blocked. And when you said, go ahead, you know, take as long as you want, then I got tough with myself and said, no, I'm not, you know, I mean, that could be 15 years, yes. you know. So I, I deliberately um, sat down to get whatever the piece was at that stage out, you know, and it came in yeah. sections. Sections. Yeah, yeah in sections, and an and opening very rhythmic section, yeah. and then um, a very uh, jazzy chordal mm -hmm. section. Yeah. And then um, a section that's that's more about silence than it is about mm -hmm. sound, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, uh, but uh, and I, I remember presenting you with the with the piece, and it was the first piece where I used the computer also to notate, yes. uh, and um, found it so limiting. You know, it's well, it must be oh. awfully hard when you're used to writing. Then well, and it's so just, slow, yeah. you know. It, yeah. it, well, but that's another topic. <laughs> but I, that was very frustrating. But I did get the piece out, and you very graciously read the piece, and we started working on it. And and I, and and in the way that you work with composers so well, which is why the literature you're developing is central and important, is to find the piece in the piece. Yeah. Every piece you find yeah. the piece well, in well, the piece. Well, you try, you try. And, and yeah. You, you may. I mean, not to digress, but you. You mentioned that the piece has uh, evolved since we first played it for you. Yeah, I it mean, has. Our own perception of it also, uh, I think, uh, because uh, I don't know exactly how, but it's become much more natural. You know, one feels, one recognizes how it's made yeah. up. Yeah, well, um, I noticed that today because I haven't heard you play it in, in, in uh, quite over a, a while, year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep, two years maybe. Yeah, even. Two years. And um, it's grown, just the fluidity you know, from one one section to the next is just really grown quite a bit. And I know um, uh, as we were getting to know the piece, I cut sev a lot, quite a bit of the opening section, That's right. quite a bit of the cadenza, the piano cadenza yes. section used yes. to have kind of a waltz yes. in it. Yes. And that's all gone yes. just to make the piece, uh, it just feels right. Where do you think we're, we're headed? So many people, uh, musicians in particular, are, are bemoaning uh, the concert, saying that it's, it's even the phrase death inch by inch That's, is being tossed around. Yeah. I take a very different point of view. Yeah. I, I see it as a tremendously enlightening experience, what's happening now. Um, we can define what it is that the abstract art music that we have devoted yeah. our life to, and every day, it's, yeah. we have passion about it every day yeah. for years yeah. and years and years. Yeah why it's different from other kinds of music. Mm -hmm. And it's because it's a journey inward. You know, that's, the music that, that I write, that you perform, mm -hmm. that Mozart has written, that Hildegard, a thousand sure. years of, of abstract sure. music, uh, is, is really an opportunity to dwell, you know, to, an, an inward kind of dwelling that um, most of the other musics don't offer. Now, my old friends Walter and Elsa Ferdare founded their trio way back in 1972, only to discover that their repertoire was basically limited to works by six well-known composers, Millot, Bartok, Stravinsky, Berg, Ives, Kachaturian, and some ad hoc transcriptions. So, instead of sitting around and complaining, as people do about the weather, they did something about it. They set out to create a literature by commissioning new works, performing them in the U.S. and around the world, and recording them and getting them public.
This is Peter Shickley, inviting you to join us for our next programs in the Making of a Medium Series 2. We will meet composers John Carlo Minotti, Joan Tower, Peter Sculthorpe, and Peter Shickley, as well as other interesting personalities from the U.S. and around the world.